Welcome everybody to the 2020 Kentucky Bourbon Festival here in Bardstown, Kentucky. This is the virtual edition and everything as you've seen so far has been recorded, but you haven't seen anything yet till you hear these guys talk. I am Steve Coombs, your host this evening, and we're going to talk about what it's like to grow up in a whiskey family. We have two prominent whiskey families with us here on my left, Wes Henderson and Kyle Henderson, his son, both from Angel's Envy. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. And on my right, the Samuels family, Bill and Rob. Bill Jr., we should stress, right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Always a junior. <laughs> as long as you introduce me, that's good enough, right? Excellent. So I've always heard from so many people that, you know, they, they look at you guys like, you know, your whiskey royalty, which I'm sure doesn't, maybe that's occurred to you, maybe not, maybe you don't care. Somebody, anytime, just jump in and answer this question. Is it something that even comes to mind that, you know, you're different, you're set apart just because in this bourbon craze, you're in a distilling family? Well, I got the first attempt at that when I started, and it was, it was anti-royalty. We were we were kind of the low end of the totem pole. Bourbon wasn't very cool. Hadn't been out of prohibition all that long. The neo-prohibitionists were still anticipating that we could take us back to prohibition. No kidding. So other than around Bardstown, it was, uh, you didn't talk too much about what the family did. And this is back in the 40s. And you're, oh, so even, so your dad still was involved with T.W. Samuels at that time? Well, he, he sold it when I was young, but we didn't get too far f from the, the Bourbon family. Colonel Bean was next door, and and John Shawnee, that owned Early Times, lived across the street, and uh, and just good friends with the Browns, the Thompsons, and and the Willets from Bardstown, of course. How many of those guys lived on Distillers Row where you guys were? Which well, is Third I was street only there for in. just a few years. Uh, there were three of us then, and back in my grandfather's day, there was a couple of more. Yeah. Uh, but they were good buds. And, and those were a little bit the heyday. It kind of wind down, started winding down, I think about 20 years before Prohibition. It started knocking the states off one at a time. Once they got the income tax passed, it was all over. Oh my gosh. How about you guys? I mean, your, your dad wasn't the brand of Brown Foreman, but he was a key distiller there. So you're a whiskey family as well. Yeah, I, growing up in the industry, uh, my dad was a scientist and that's really how I looked at my father. I didn't really, uh, understand or probably even appreciate the history of bourbon growing up in it. It was just a commodity in my house. It was something that my dad did every day. He went to work and did it. It wasn't until I got much older that I really started to say, wow, dad, you know, when dad created Woodford and other things started really happening, that I, I noticed how significant. And, you know, I always heard about dad knowing Bill and Jimmy and all these, these icons in the industry, but um, I it was much older before I really, really appreciated. And now, you know, every day I wake up, I'm thankful that I'm, I'm a small part of, of what we're trying to do here. Now, the sons in the room grew up at different stages for you, especially Maker's Mark was red hot by the time you were born, wasn't it, I you guess? Know, you know, I, I think I remember Maker's Mark mm -hmm. always being celebrated here in Kentucky. But as soon as you got outside Kentucky, it was very much a discovery Talk brand. about You and I have talked about that because you went to University of South Carolina I did. I, where I, there was almost <laughs> no Maker's Mark. Right? I remember through research, <laughs> that on campus, that there were actually only two on-premise accounts in all of Columbia, South Carolina that had Maker's Mark on the bar, and it was only because both of the owners, that's what they drank. And that was, I mean, Maker, I mean, it, and I think we still to this day are grateful for Kentuckians because were it not for Kentuckians here in the home of bourbon, I don't know that Maker's Mark would have ever survived. And it was the better part of 25 years where we were really a Kentucky-only brand. But to see well, any other way around too, Rob, we were the only bourbon trying to prop this whole thing up for years and years and years. So it was a little lonely and a little counterculture. So oh, it, you really beat the bourbon drum hard. I, I really think out of, out of any any we distillery, to, we didn't have anything else. I didn't want to practice <laughs> law. I, that would have been a disaster Did, for. Well, what, was, what was it like? <laughs> but what was it like to see your dad dressed up in some of the crazy outfits oh. that he got on to to get the name out there? Well, you know what I, I remember that my dad just lived the industry and it was it was an obsession it was a passion and it was more than just making whiskey that he was proud of that i reflect back on that his legacy mm -hmm. even we are so proud of and live today i mean it's it's uh it's the community aspects it's it's doing things in a principled way you know not it's never uh -huh. the easy way 
Um, and then having fun along, you know, as part of it in the entertaining and the hospitality. The first, the first uh, derby party that I remember that my parents had was 35 people in the Highlands. And I think the last one they had was over 2,500 of their closest friends. With, oh my gosh. With little Richard. And it was, I mean, so it's uh, out in Prospect? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's back when Prospect was dry. Try that on for size. You got to invite all the policemen to the party. <laughs> the sheriff was there. As you should. The sheriff was partaking. Oh, my gosh. Mm. So you were in college when this business was getting started up, right? Yeah, 10 years ago. So did they ever expect you to be the guy to give them the whiskey hookup, all your, your college buddies? Never. No. Well, I mean, we so I mean, we were still kind of starting the concept. My dad was working for another company uh, you were out in Alabama. at the time, right? At the time. And... Um, we, we may or may not have tried that and, and knew of it. Um, but, you know, really, this brand didn't get started until August of 2010 when I, when I left school to come up here. So it was kind of in that transition before I really got involved. Not, not, you know, not too heavily talked about while I was in school. When I decided to start this thing, and then the first thing was to go convince my father to work with us when we did it. Uh, to move all the kids up from Florida, six kids, a bunch of dogs, a bunch of other pets, and you know, on an idea is really what we did. It was an idea to do this, and you know, we yanked them all out of school. Looking back now, it was really a, probably a crazy idea and, and a crazy thing to <laughs> paid do. Paid off though. It, it definitely paid off, yeah. but you look at you know what my wife, the, the sacrifices she had to make, and you know, she was used to me having crazy ideas all the time anyway. But and six boys, right? On top of right, that. six kids for an idea. Oh, so right. not just six boys? Or is oh, it six boys. Yeah, that's six how I thought. Boys. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you add in, what, four dogs, two birds, a fish, and a bearded dragon, and we moved all of them up to Kentucky from Florida for some crazy idea. And uh, now your dad's business was a fledgling idea, too, when, when you were in college, maybe? Or you were, well, you were maybe I was, high school I was actually, it, was, it took us a long time to get started, and it took a long time to get off the ground, and so it, it wasn't compressed as things are today. Uh, he, he started in 53, or bought the property, started in early 54. And, uh, and I came back in 67, and in 69 he announced at the annual meeting that we made a profit, first time. And we didn't make a profit because he wasn't taking a salary. So it really wasn't a profit, but that's a, I mean, that's 16 years. So, uh, you know, I always say this is a hobby. I have signed up for a hobby. This is th this is not. I better keep going to my CLE classes, so I can keep my law license current, <laughs> just in case. When did you fully sign on? Seventies, wasn't it? Something no, I signed on in '67, and he he uh, he said, "Here, you be president in '75." And it really had more to do with when it got out of Kentucky, he had to travel, and he didn't want to travel. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll keep the checkbook just in case you screw it up. But, <laughs> but you be pressed. Did, right. Talk about your relationship with, with Lincoln, your dad, mm -hmm. and, and, and how that worked out. What was the dynamic there? Was, was he the boss? At what point in life are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you said, we're going into business together. For you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did you get orders like that? I'm keeping the checkbook and you go well, travel? Because I know you travel I do think it's interesting, though, eventually how the dynamic changes, the who's the parent, who's the child. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, Dad trusted my business instincts and abilities to build things, and I'd always done it for years. And I always trusted Dad to, to really be that steadying presence and, and guide us. You know, I had an idea what we wanted to do. Dad was very much hands-off. Dad's like, look, I'm going to be here to support you. I'll be a quiet presence. I'm going to bring to the table the, the, the uh, integrity that I have and the reputation I have in the industry, and we're going to help you get where you want to get. He wanted to work with, with his grandsons, too. Mm -hmm. Those are the only things I think. Dad was retired. He had he'd, he'd finished with Woodford. That was a walk-off home run. He didn't have to come back to work. Um, and the only reason he did it was to work with us. And um, so, you know, it was, it was Dad just doing what he did, you know, just a quiet presence in the background with a lot of really bad jokes. <laughs> how, how long did you get to work with him? Because he died in 2017, is that in correct? In 2013. 2013. 2013. Oh, oh my gosh. So wow. actively for about two years, and then the last year was just a lot more talks and conversations about, you know, what ifs and what went wrong and what went well and, you know, trying to get almost a kickstart on what not to do, which is always important. Sometimes. Is it easy to, to take off the grandson hat and put on the employee's hat or no. partner's hat? No, no, not at all. What was the struggle in that? Just, there's no, there's no separation of that. The, the, oh, there was no taking off. No, the there isn't. It's, it's all, it's one of the same. Yeah, it's. I mean, even now, 
at home, at family events, all we do is talk about work. It's fun, we enjoy it, but. I, I think as long as it's not a problem, yeah. you know, I think it's good to have a little bit of separation, but it's our life, it's our family, it's our business. And, and you know, I mean, we may not have serious conversations at home about it, but I'm always gonna say how, how things go today. You know, I always ask Colin, anything I need to know about? Yeah. You know, we didn't burn anything down today. No, nothing everything, caught fire. Today. Everything's good. That's a good day when nothing burns down. I think for, for us, and I, you know, I still get to spend a lot of time with my dad. As long as you have a shared vision for the future, you're not ever, you're not always going to agree on everything, but all of the big things, you're always moving in the same direction. And to have an opportunity day in and day out to work on mm -hmm. a legacy in the future and do things you're proud of is is pretty incredible. Now, you took a departure. I mean, you did, when you got out of college, you went to work mm -hmm. for other liquor companies. Was that at your direction or was that your decision? No, it's his decision. Because With you... strong encouragement. <laughs> he, said, he, he said, you know, when you well, go Well, we make... were just glad to get him out of school. <laughs> Jesus. You don't have to bring that up. <laughs> I have a similar story. It's okay. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was a great blessing for me because you know, do you have a fondness for a family legacy that you're, you know, that your family's been involved with is a very different question if you want to make it your life's work. And the fact that I was able to get outside the shadows of Kentucky, outside the shadows of Maker's Mark and prove to myself that I love the industry beyond just having an affection for something our family was involved with creating was important to me. And I want my, for me, I wanted to be invited back. I never wanted my dad to feel like he had to hire his son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and thankfully that day did come after about 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers so, crossed. <laughs> so like when you talk to Fred No, he'll say that Booker said, oh, so you want to be in the distilling business? Or you're starting there, third shift, mm -hmm. bottling line. Did, did, how did that work for any of you guys? Did you start at the very bottom to, to work your way up? Or? Rob got a lot of that when he was in high school uh, at the distillery in the summers. And of course, what distinguishes makers is we have a flood every year. Being down the valley, and Rob had the job of pump, it, just getting the motors out of the water and various other things nobody else wanted to do. But uh, when he got out of school, I've always believed <coughs> once you know how to make great whiskey, you got to find customers. And so he started on the commercial side, and uh, and I, at that time, was the uh, self-appointed marketing director. So those are the two pieces we were most interested in, getting out of Kentucky and then eventually becoming an international success. I think that's really good that Rob has that experience. You know, that's one thing I wish I was able to do more with the boys. You know, the boys are kind of in the thick of it now because that's where we need them as opposed to where I would like them to be out learning more about the commercial side and learning about other aspects of the business. And, and I'm trying to do that with the younger ones, but I think to have that perspective like you have, have that experience and then be away is, is really a great, and the kids pretty much start doing it at the, at the bottom. I mean, Kyle was probably a little more elevated because we needed him to learn things quickly, mm -hmm. but his brothers started out, you know, doing whatever we need. In a small business, you do what you need to do. Yes. Right. If the floor yeah. needs to be swept, we sweep the floor, oh, you know, they, they still whatever. Floor. And I want them to have that mentality and, and always think that, you know, that you need to do what needs to be done around there. You know, this is your family business. Your name's on the bottle. You need to have that pride and, and you, need to, you need to lead better than anybody else. How many of the, of the boys are going to be in the business, do you think? Well, right now, four of the six are. The other two are still in college and high school, so we don't know what they're going to do. Hopefully, they'll, they'll join the business, but I've never pushed them in that direction. I've dangled it in front of them a little bit, but never pushed them. <laughs> now, it's interesting too, when I was looking at some of my notes about what you guys have done when I've talked to you, you studied aeronautics, mm -hmm. right? You were in rocket science, right? There's almost like this subtle Freudian thing that you want to fly away from those businesses. <laughs> is, is there any truth to that? No, it flew away from me when I blew up the office building down there in, uh, out, out in California. That was, the, that was the end of my short-lived aerospace career. You want to talk about the end of your short-lived aerospace career? How was yours, babes? <laughs> well, I, I I walked away from a very spectacular plane crash, but other than that, you know, other than that, yeah. Were you on the plane? Yeah, I was flying. The plane. Flying the plane. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So but I tell people now, if you're on a plane next to me, the odds of it going down are very slim because I've already been in one. What are the odds of happening again? So, uh, but you know, there is one Kentucky distiller that took two down. Really? Oh, Who's that? Charles Medley. 
Oh my God! Imagine wow. really. Yeah, one when he was in high school, and one when he was like a freshman in college. I'm never traveling with you again. Both. <laughs> in all fairness, it wasn't my fault. And he walked from both. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's uh, maybe there's something there. I don't know, but my wife won't let me anymore. So I'm, I've moved on to other non-dangerous pursuits like. The but fire service and other things. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's there, right. There's no hazard there. He was out with a friend of mine running around being a coroner one night, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. Golly. So you retired in 2011, and mm -hmm. you failed miserably at that, right? No, no, I did. I, I did pretty good. Rob's better at answering that, but uh, <laughs> he gave me an office, and I, I've gotten pretty good at working crossword puzzles. And... Uh, is that uh, true, Rob? I get his advice on everything. I Crossword mean, are puzzles or, or, or business? <laughs> everything, everything. No, I mean, it's, I admire him as a leader. I, I think he's made courageous decisions uh, for Maker's Mark, for the industry, for our community. And I mean, I don't know, I'll probably ask him his thoughts three or four times a day. And it's a blessing to have him this close and involved. And I, you know, I just think it's important. And I do everything I can to, to button it up when I've got a counter. Most of the little stuff we disagree with is because I don't know what he's doing. The conceptual, big picture, perfectly aligned. The little picture where I see something stupid, it's because I don't know what's going on usually. It, it, does it become unstupid when you figure it out or Rob explains it? Sometimes and when it doesn't, I just keep quiet. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Sometimes with, with, with change, things get easier. There's better ways to do stuff than maybe you did them. Yeah. Also, there are more complicated ways. To, we find complicated ways to do stuff, you know, that could have been done much easier. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, but I have to, as I'm thinking about this, you know, and I have to say that, I mean, I admire Bill for a million reasons, but not, I admire him for what he does outside of the bourbon industry as much as I do what he did inside the bourbon industry, you know, as a community involvement on, you know, boards and, you know, his philanthropy and all those things, you know, and I think eventually we ought to touch on some of that stuff because he probably won't talk about it himself. Not me. Yeah, because I mean, that's a, an, an unusual thing for people in any job, unless you're a company leader, that all of that outreach stuff is important, both for the brand building, but the bourbon community is deeply involved in charitable work mm -hmm. all over, not just in Kentucky. How, how significant, I mean, did, did, that ever, did that ever be something that was on your mind? It's like, oh, I have to do that, or did it just come naturally? Because people are attracted to whiskey. Well, with, with us, it was, it was expected, because my grandfather was the mayor here. He was on the city council for like 20 years and hid my old Kentucky home after James Conway bought it in the highway department. He was the uh, Commissioner of Highways for Kentucky. We didn't have a park system, so somebody had to own it until we got a park system formed. He built the golf course, built the first swimming pool, built the... Your grandfather did? Uh -huh, wow. The Bardstown Independent School District. He was the charter trustee of that. And Dad followed suit and, uh, you know, was active. And when I got out of school, he said, pick two organizations I want you to get involved with. And within five years, I want both of them to invite you to chair the board. So what he was saying is don't join something and just wow, sit on your ass. And it just kind of got it started. But I'll tell you, one of the most fun things I did, I don't talk about it because it aggravated everybody at the time, was Steve Lowry and I really started the Bourbon Festival. Steve was the publisher Steve, of a newspaper, right? In Lebanon. Yeah. And so he wasn't from Bardstown. I living was living in Enterprise, right? I was living in Louisville, and they wanted to get the distilleries involved. And my concept was, let's do it. And what we're going to do, we're going to have, you know, everybody's thinking trade booths and all mm -hmm. cardboard stuff. And I said, we're going to embarrass the hell out of every single distiller here. And it'll either piss them off or next year they'll do a great job, and it'll start to elevate this thing. And we had Oriental rugs and... Uh, silver and antique furniture. This is in a Maker's Mark booth, I guess. Well, it yeah. was out in the lawn of Mo Kentucky Old, and they only had one 15 amp plug, and I went out and hit it three days before, so we had the only lighted booth <laughs> in the whole thing. <laughs> I mean, it, it was the tackiest thing I've ever done in my life. But next year, there wasn't any cardboard either. Mm. So it started to work, and that's, and that's when we started to bring the outside people in. Wow. Pretty cool. Talk about... Um, how people, do you ever feel that people want to get close to your family either for, to be part of the spotlight, be 
connected to the booze to just, I mean, do they think they're brushing up against stars in the industry now or, or do they not, are they not that obsequious about it and just. I think they're interested in the, in the historical, yeah. and they weren't forever. Right. I mean, over the years, uh, our house has kind of become a museum of stuff. Your house on Star Hill Farms or? No, the one in Louisville. Okay. One in Louisville, and up until COVID, we would entertain two to four trade groups a week. Wow. At the house, they couldn't wait to see all the junk. <laughs> and a, a lot of it is junk. <laughs> I think you see it though too with, I mean, I remember early visitorship at Maker's Mark because we pretty much had visitors since the beginning, but it was, all, it was a lot of locals and it were, if they weren't local, they were just looking for a free tour on you know, these big bus tours and things. <clears throat> and it's changed so dramatically with the level of interest, destination, people traveling great distance, and they want to soak everything up. And they want to, you know, they're genuinely interested, which is, I think is exciting. And, you know, we, I think we both try to spend as much time as we can with, with groups, with visitors, with our friends when they come see us. So you're not skulking from building to building. You, you, you want to walk out there and see people. Oh, oh man, oh that's gosh, the, yeah. Oh, awesome. That's been the best part of retirement for me is just being able to go hang out. And that's what pisses me off the most about COVID mm, is we can't do it. Yep. I'm the same way. I love to come down to the, the brand home and visit. And, uh, but, you know, really makers laid the groundwork for, for those type of experiences that without that, I wouldn't have been able to bring bourbon to downtown Louisville again. You know, Angels Envy would not have this beautiful brand home. And, you know, we, we saw what they built and we said, hey, we can do this. We can bring bourbon back to Louisville where it used to be years mm -hmm. and years and years ago. Um, but, you know, I get invited to parties all the time. I know it's not because I'm smart and funny and, and but attractive. But you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have booze with me when I come to the yeah. parties. Uh -huh. so, but look, as long as I get in the door, I don't care how I got there. Uh, but it, it's been an experience. But I love visiting with, with friends of the brand. It's so much fun. It's the best part of what I do. For five generations, over 100 years, our family-owned company has sourced quality white oak for staves and cooperage. Our craftsmen and women are the heart of independent stave company. Their skills, paired with equipment designed by our own engineers, shape the staves into barrels, ensuring quality at every step. We partner with distillers to find the perfect toast and char recipe that will develop specific flavors while aging their unique spirit. From our classic charred barrel to our innovative small batch series, ISC builds custom barrel programs for distillers who craft the world's finest spirits. Talk about mothers since we're talking about where tourism started and your mom margie was is oft credited for that vision so um what kind of person was she was she was she just partly so hospitable hospitable <coughs> that she wanted people there or she just saw that that was the future of bourbon tourism no she was very conceptual very opinionated and really kind of a hard ass <laughs> uh she was, and your dad was the softy, right? She was, he was the softy. Yeah. She had great taste. She was super smart. And uh, she just decided in certain areas she knew best. She, she didn't hang around. She wasn't much of an operator. She was a lightning rod. When, when, just when things were bogging down or weren't going in the right, mm -hmm. she'd come in, swoop in like Superman, fix it, and then leave. Uh, I, I could, I, the list would go on. But... Uh, this is the most obvious that she did. She didn't trust anybody to mess. She said, I'll take care of this. And uh, she did all the restoration 
of the facility. She started what is now the Bourbon Trail, just to give my sister a job back in the 60s. And then she didn't show up and almost died. But uh, now anytime, anytime we needed something bigger than average to happen, she was, you know, she was there. Okay. Did, did, did your, but that doesn't mean it was fun. <laughs> so, mm -mm. Because, you know, my sisters and I weren't quite as smart as she was, and we heard about it every day. <laughs> every day during the school year. <laughs> did you wow. get to know your grandmother at all? I did. Yeah. You know, she passed um, when I was in later middle school, and then my grandfather passed, and uh, I was a freshman in college in 1992. But what, what inspires me and I think energizes our entire team is everything we're doing today is still very much their vision. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, you know, we think about their legacy and the, the legacy of the founders. And we, of course, celebrate the stories of the past and what they mean to who we are foundationally. But it's really they are still the guiding light for everything we do. I mean, all of the whiskeys that we're thinking about for the future, all of the experiences we're envisioning across our 1,200 acre Star Hill farm, everything is through their inspiration. So, like you said, just kind of a slow ascent. All the time because I've gotten to see the what's going to be the nature preserve with you and yeah some really big ideas it's going on here. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Mm -hmm. Exactly right. What was your, what was your mom like, Wes? I think out of the two, very similar to the dynamic with with the Samuels family. My mom was definitely more opinionated. Uh, my my father was much more soft spoken, and I probably get my stubbornness and my. Um, Stubbornness, probably from my mom. Well, and I'd like to second that motion, you and me. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of times there was a conflict there, but I think at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I have that streak, you know, that unwillingness to compromise, mm -hmm. you know, compromise the vision, compromise. It's not that I'm not willing to compromise, I'm not willing to compromise the values and the vision. Uh, and that, that probably comes from my mom. Uh, with my father, it's more of a, of a, of a happy-go-lucky. We can take it any, you know, we, any situation that gets thrown at us, we can handle it with some humor and, you know, and, and, and some brains. So that's the way dad was. Dad was very laid back. And um, so I was, you know, very blessed, I think, to get what I think are the best parts of both of them. Well, talk about your wives, because I would imagine that you guys have to have a long leash to be able to build companies, to build brands. And, and uh, I, I had I got a good one. She uh, she's still she's she's still looking to be inducted into the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, and her her claim to fame is that she's hosted more doodahs than than everybody else put together, <laughs> and she thinks that ought to be worthy of rec of uh, certainly in the Maker's Mark Hall of Fame. She probably has served more Maker's Mark. Yeah. than maybe any human in the world, any bartender in the world, got, with all the hosting they've done. It's the number one the account in Louisville's our house. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was number COVID. one on Brennan's account. <laughs> Keeneland's number two. Keeneland. <laughs> <laughs> what about your wife? She got six boys. Well, you said pretty long leash. You know, all leashes lead to the dog house, as far as I'm concerned. So I spent a lot of my time. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes... Uh, That's, hence all the, all the pets, right? All yeah, the animals you it's, can take uh, around. You know... Julie's amazing. She really is. To to you know, if you see Julie, she's five foot tall, hundred pounds soaking wet. You know, just uh, but uh, everything is family to her. Uh, everything is. You know, she's always been so supportive of anything, any crazy ass idea I've had, and there've been a lot of crazy ones that haven't worked. And fortunately, we found one that I think did work. But you know, she she deserves a place in the Hall of Fame as well because none of this would have happened with, without her. Let's talk about this. I mean, you guys are sharing some war stories, as it were, a moment ago, and I would imagine people see only that product and think, boy, this is fun. They travel the world promoting their brand, but you're talking about the hell of every year the government's changing what goes into red wax and how you all had to, had to sort through a crisis like that. Well, then we get focused on red wax and the labels start falling off. <laughs> I mean, mm. I mean who'd, have, who'd have thought? Yeah. And it's just one of those things you don't know they're falling off until they're already out in the stores. Start getting phone calls. Hey, I yeah. got a problem. Yeah. So it, it, it's uh, part of what what Rob's been able to bring to the table. And we we mm -hmm. had a leg up on it, but in the early days, uh, it was a lot of it was a lot of firefighting, little things. Because you're doing new things all the time. If we'd have any, any idea what we were doing, we didn't we didn't really understand the chemistry of glue. 
Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> one of the stupidest things was mom was hell-bent on having a cork. And of course, this is when they were real corks, which meant they were irregular, okay? So dad takes the little thing down and dips it in a wax pot, puts it back up. The cork shoots up about 20 feet up in the air because the air got hot and it wasn't, it wasn't one of the big diameter corks, it was a little small. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we would uh, we'd say, oh, we'll fix this, we'll sort through them. So then we, we got it. And then people would, would take it and put it in the, in the back seat of their car in the middle of August. <laughs> And it would blow, and we'd have, we'd have, we'd, I mean, we were making repairs to cars and, and this all kind of stuff. But it, those are the early days, and we got better. And it's a good thing. Of course, we weren't, we only had eight or nine customers back then, so we, we kind of knew who they were. <laughs> but it's funny you mentioned the corks. We went through the same situation, yeah. you know, how many years later. But as a small business, you know, we didn't have a lab to test this stuff. So mm. I put, I put, bottles in a, in a sink in a bar with a heat lamp on them and a thermometer to figure out how hot they would get before they would pop. I mean, for to determine chill flock instead of running them through a lab, mm -hmm. I'd wait till there was snow on the back deck and I'd stick it, the bottles in the snow to see how whether the bottles would flock or mm -hmm. not. That was our quality control. Um, <laughs> we, have, we haven't gotten much more scientific, but guess what? honestly. It's the same science. <laughs> mm -hmm. If it gets cold and it's a certain, you know, certain uh, uh, construction, it's going to flock. You know, so you know, sometimes we make things more complicated than we have to, and we touched on that earlier. But um, it's, uh, the, the, you forget that this is not just the sexy thing of making some bourbon and putting it in a bottle. It's a consumer product. It's a consumer packaged product. So there are all these elements uh, of this bottle, including the cork, the labels, the, the engraving, all these things and the boxes, all these elements have to come into play. And uh, the, you're, you're, there's a lot more to the business than just this. So as, yeah. as Bill said, putting out fires is, especially early on when you're a small company, that's what you do. But guess what we learn from that now? You know, we've been involved in those fires from the very beginning, and then we know how, to, how those things start and how to put them out. Is, is it any different <clears throat> putting out fires with employees versus family employees? Is that harder? Is that a challenge at all? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Well, you still have corporal punishment you can use on your, on your, on your family members to a certain point. Um, Make an example out of Kyle in front of all uh, the hired employees? No, look, it's the same thing in dealing with families as consumers is, is that anytime there's an issue, you own it. You know, you, you make sincere efforts to, to make it right. And then you make efforts to prevent it from happening again. And that's that transparency. You know, I've found more than anything, if, you, if you're talking to somebody and say, yeah, we screwed up. You know, we failed, we didn't meet our expectations or yours, that nine times out of 10, you're getting an opportunity to make it right. And guess what? People have more admiration for you and what you do when things go wrong mm -hmm. than what you do when things go right. Same way with your family members. Do you get the double dose of it if something goes wrong and you get your dad's expectations and the consumer's expectations? Or uh, Usually they're aligned, so it doesn't, it's not too bad. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I get a little bit of both, a little bit of both. And like we talked about earlier, it's one thing with the consumer because, you know, you can you, you'll, that conversation will end at some point. Maybe may call back, but when I go home, we're still talking about it. Oh, or 10 years later, remember that dumb thing you did 10 years ago? Let's not do that again. But that's just the family thing. Yes, that's a family there. thing. You know, <laughs> we're going to stick it in there a little bit and turn the screw a little bit where we can. Now, now that you're retired, Bill, and, and the company is a global brand, mm -hmm. did you ever feel that you're so far away from things that, that you can't? Um, or don't maybe have to, or don't feel the pressure of fixing a, a bad cork or a bad wax issue? Does it, or are you was, just always the brand That's what I engaged? had to really get over, was meddling in other people's business. It's, it's been a hate, it's, it's, I think most engineers are like that anyway, and I certainly was. But uh, uh, the big thing with me, because I've always been better conceptually than I was tactically, when I graduated from engineering school, I'm walking down the aisle, dad sitting right on the edge. He pulled on my little thing. He said, you know, you're probably the only person in this line of 350 engineers that don't know which way to turn a light bulb to screw it in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's what I'm, I'm really good with the ideas <laughs> and not so good with the others. So I, I've always kind of stayed away from, from trying to fix something that might, that might hurt me. So that was your 
plastics, Benjamin. Plastic speech. Plastic speech, that's right. <laughs> and now... Learn to turn in a light bulb. And, hmm. uh, to me now, it's, it's really... Amazing. Are you old enough to get that reference? Nope. That's the graduate. You need to see that movie. Yeah. I know you're old enough. No, I I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen the graduate. Oh, you're kidding. Well, I'm, it's yeah, a great that movie. That was the late 60s, though, right? Yeah. I was three years yeah. old. Sorry. So guys. was I. No offense. <laughs> That's, uh, what, what was, was he joking at all? What, was, was your dad joking or was, was he kind of giving it to you like he was talking about the family dynamic, giving, kind of yeah. sticking it to you? No, he was, uh, he, he was easy. He was, I was, I was generally, when there was opportunity to lunge, I was usually the one doing the lunge. <laughs> and he was usually the one holding his breath, hoping that, you know, it wasn't too big a disaster. Did he ever resent, I shouldn't say resent, but, um, well, maybe resent that, that it grew as big as it did because because he just oh. wanted to make whiskey it was his he, thing. Yeah, right? that's the but that's the foundation that's still there, and I think <clears> that's <throat> why Rob has has done such an incredible job of keeping everybody hooked in and involved and engaged. Uh, there's probably not another business in the state of Kentucky that has the total engagement that the people at Makers do, and it's it's just because of the respect respect for the fact that as we become an international brand, we, we, we're making the, what's inside just like it was. Grain comes from the same source. Now we had to figure out how to grow the farmer, you know, in order to do that. But uh, and, our, and my grandfather, the way he was made up and his patience and his, you know, willing to wait was, pr was pretty important to the finished product. I mean, he started making the whiskey and then was comfortable and just committed. The only thing he was really interested in was, was his taste vision. And the fact that he was willing to wait over six years for that first bottle, um, you know, that's, that's a defining aspect of who Maker's Mark has become. And I think looking back, the complimentary contributions from the different family members has, has been really instrumental. To the, to the brand's success. Are, are there any, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rob, finish. No, no, I just, because you know, he couldn't be more, any more different than his dad. He's probably more like his mom, but they all complimented each other, which is so important. Are there any uh, other Samuels family members in the business? Has that grown out at all? Have cousins come <laughs> in? Have nieces, nephews, <laughs> anybody come in? Mm -mm. No? Not yet. <laughs> well, how do you they're think? They're all young, they're all babies. <laughs> oh, well. One nope. just got None a driver's cousins, license though, right? yesterday. Mm -hmm. What's that? Uh, the oldest one just got a driver's license yesterday. Oh, so okay. they, they got a ways to go. Do they want to get in? Do you know? I your think kids? as a parent, you just want your kids to chase their dream and their passion. And, you know, maybe you keep your fingers crossed that, yeah. that they at least have an opportunity to experience it and fall in love with it. And, you know, I don't think you'd want them to feel obligated. But, but they're the fam curious. The family they're business curious. is that narrow. At this point, it doesn't, because you hear a lot, the beams, the beams are everywhere, right? <laughs> the beams in their offspring. I was just curious. I've never heard of anybody say, well, that's, that's uh, Bill's brother. Well, we've been at this for eight, nine generations. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's only been one, <clears throat> only one successor in each Man. generation all the way down. You're trying to build a whole distillery team. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to do. Um, <laughs> I, I say there's no plan. My wife said there was a plan on how we end up with six kids, um, but just a big Catholic, a big loud Catholic family mm -hmm. that doesn't know when to stop, I guess. But <laughs> Do each of the, your children that are involved, do they each enjoy different aspects of, of Angel's Envy? They, they do. Uh, you know, Kyle, of course, is our production manager. Andrew's our lead distiller. The other two work in the barrel maturation, maturation warehouse. They also have experience mm -hmm. in processing. So, but I would like to see them get exposure to, to the commercial side. Yeah, I'd like I would to see encourage them, it. Definitely. Um, what I do you mean mind, by the commercial side? Well, on the, on the sales side, on the, the how the business operates like that, I wouldn't mind sending one of them maybe over to Southern to work for a while, or distributor, uh, you know, on the marketing side. But like I said, we've had them where we needed them as well. So we'll see if we can get them, you know, more experience. But they all enjoy doing what they're doing, I, I think. And they all have a desire to learn and grow, and they've mm -hmm. really, you know, they've really jumped in. Mm -hmm. We've had to learn it all, you know. I mean, we only had Dad for a few years of operating this business, and Dad was not alive when we opened the distillery, so we had to figure it out on our own. But all the time, inspired by what my dad's vision was, and, and you know what his expectations were, it's a shame he wasn't around to see the distillery run. Absolutely, he would have been in heaven, yeah. just walking around that place, 
just the science aspect of it. And uh, but you know, he's he's still you know we still are inspiration every day. Talk about his dad. I never got to meet Lincoln. <laughs> well, he's he he was absolutely one of the nicest people that ever existed. And and if you needed help on something, you you called him. We called him a lot. Brown Foreman as a company was was terrific at at helping. Uh, the industry members, as were the beams. Uh, I think on Whiskey Matters, uh, we called Lincoln, especially barrels, because they had a barrel factory. And, you know, when you had, had barrel issues, well, he said, I don't know anything about this. I got to go see Bert Deutsch. He was running, but, but I couldn't call Bert. And, and so that, uh, and we served together on industry uh, boards and committees. And, he didn't say too much until it was the right moment to say something. <laughs> That's, I know you've noticed that. That's a skill. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's special within the industry that we work together on all of the things that matter oh, that the most. Was and that's thing. pretty unique. Talk about the, the, the extended family of the distilling industry. I see it. I see examples of it where from the outside in, you would say we're competing. But on the topics that are really important to the future of our industry, we're joined together. Um, most every distillery in Kentucky is a member of the Kentucky Distillers Association and it's been a really important part of our success is the fact that we work so well together. Well, I think Max Shapiro over at Heaven Hill, the president, he said, we will fight to the death over that last inch of shelf space in a liquor store, but when you need help, we're there for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I, that, I yeah. think there's, you know, I, and I agree to a certain extent with, with, with Max on that, but you know, I, I believe there's plenty of room for everybody. And you know, I always want to win, but I never want to win at the detriment of, of my, you know, the people I work with in the industry. I'm always talking about other brands as my favorite. You know, I mean, I drink a lot of different whiskeys, and I recommend other whiskeys to people. So, uh, you know, that that's real. That's okay. rare because you're not going to hear a Pepsi guy recommending Coke. No, <laughs> they get, they get fired. <laughs> yeah, no. but 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 guess what? I don't think there's that familiar heritage, familial heritage there. Yeah. I mean, I guess in some ways there may be, but you know, the guys on the front line there. There's just two of the big sodas out there, and they don't care about that. Uh, I think we legitimately care about each other's families. We've grown up together. We have vested interest in the, in the industry on a whole, and Rob made a really good point. The industry stands together on issues that are important to the industry, on issues that are important to responsible consumption. You know, we're, we're very strong on those together, and it, it helps us all rise up. But, you know, uh, I want them to do well. I want us to do well. There's plenty of room out there. We got a whole well, world that he works for. And I in. think because of that, we were able to get legislative support for the great majority of our initiatives that allowed us to get into the hospitality industry and also not have these incredibly punitive taxes. Mm -hmm. So they trusted us enough to, okay, we'll take the initial hit, we the tax mm -hmm. the government. And in hindsight, they have, uh, the state of Kentucky has, has really benefited from the resurgence of the industry. And it's really been possible because we've always said, if it ain't good for Kentucky, it's not good for us. But that's, that's been an important part of the success is viewing the industry for more than just producing a product. I mean, the jobs with the growth of our industry it's not just 200 incremental jobs in Marion County, it's 200 jobs that pay double what the next highest manufacturing job in Marion County is. I mean, it changes lives and we see that every day. The cultural benefit and it, you know, just how we're perceived as an industry here in our home state to see how that has changed so dramatically in just a few years has is, is, is been exciting to see. You know, you had talked a moment ago about back in the 50s, there were people post-prohibitionists who still wanted to pull it back. And I've talked to a lot of um, officials in Kentucky that talk about even towns now that say, we still want to stay dry, but we love bourbon tourism because it's benefiting our state. So we'll vote for those initiatives, you know, that help the distilling industry because they finally understand it. But that's been a hard slog, right, right to get anybody to listen. Well, mm -hmm. it never would have happened if we wouldn't have been credible when we went to the legislature and when says, don't help us, help, let's get together and help Kentucky. The first big bill was what, about 12 years ago? Mm -hmm. That when I retired, right before I retired. And that was tax bill. Uh, and then we, all we did was just say, give us the same rights that we can host as the wine industry has in California. 
and the supporters lined up. We, there's still a couple that will not sign off on a bill if the word liquor is in it. Doesn't make any difference what it says. It's just if, wow. but those are diminishing fairly rapidly. And it's for the betterment of, of them and ever, you know, the entire state. Speaking of the entire state, let's talk one last question about the distillery boom that we have, certainly the craft distilleries, which just makes me laugh to think you guys are ever considered a craft distillery. That, that didn't last long, did it? Um, what would you guys tell people getting into the distilling industry, regardless of their size, about a family venture? We'll start with you first. Both of you guys go. Do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, take a leap. Uh, there's no other way to, and we did. Uh, I don't regret it at all. You know, if it's a great industry, great people. If you've got a dream to do that, it's not easy. This definitely hasn't been easy for any of us. We made a ton of sacrifice. You know, you, like I said earlier, you see what's in this bottle. You know, the uh, countless hours on the road, you know, away from my family. Bill, you did it. Rob, you do it now. Kyle does it a little bit. But, you know, if I'm on the road 70% of the time out promoting my brand, that's 70% of the time I'm not with my family. But you know, if you can manage to keep it all together and, 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 and create something that's got history and legacy, go for it. Welcome. We'll, we'll have you. Come on in. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about you, Kyle? Uh, I, I mean, I agree. I think there's a lot of people that are kind of cautious about it, and there should be some caution. But, um, yeah, just, just do it. Do it. Because whether it's directly family or industry family, we're all here to support each other. So we'll be there. It's not Bill? cheap. Well, it's not it's cheap. Not have, cheap. A, it's have, not. A, have some Reese. Have some wherewithal. <laughs> well, again, from the from the family perspective, what would you say? I mean, would you say get oh, in with your family or, or don't do it? No. The the most important piece of advice is do it in Kentucky, where the bankers understand the industry, where you've got a a, a legislature that's on board. You've got support organizations uh, like Moontown University, like the Kentucky Distillers Association. And you got us to talk to. I mean, when the craft industry started, uh, Booker and uh, myself. Jimmy. And Jimmy spent oh. a lot of time with the craft industry. And it was great fun. I loved it. I mean, I, was, I went all over the state talking to people about it. And it was mainly talking about safety first. Mm -hmm. but, but to make the kind of whiskey you want, but for God's sakes, understand what you're doing from a safety perspective. Uh, all that's here. And we still make, what, about 85 to 87% of the world's bourbon. So why go outside Kentucky and fail? Rob, what would you say? I would say if it's your passion and your dream, go all in and surround yourself with really, really good people. I mean, those are the things that are, I think, have been pretty important to our success. Good stuff, gentlemen. I wanted to thank you again for being here at the virtual. Kentucky Bourbon Festival. <laughs> Where's our glass of whiskey? That's the only thing. No, we failed. We're, sur <laughs> we're surrounded by it. Well, we're we we're going to tap some of these before we take off here, I think. <laughs> Thanks again. Stay with us. Sit with us. Sip with us. There's more to come.